story of doom, isn't it, with that note of hope, and we'll come to it. The end, what happens to Jehoiakim when he's in exile? It made me think of something I was reading this week by a pastor called Ray Ortland. Some of you may have heard of Ray Ortland. He's a very fine man, very fine pastor and writer, and I've always been helped by his books. One particular sentence that he wrote stood out to me. One of the reasons I find his books so helpful is because they are refreshingly honest about the Christian life and deeply encouraging, especially when I face my own struggles <coughs> against remaining sin in me that still seems to lie so deep-rooted in my heart. I wonder if you know what I'm talking about. Are you a fellow struggler with me? Do you know what it's like to be faced with your own failures, to be holy? <coughs> Not just once, but over and over? Do you experience some small victories? I think every Christian will. And yet, at the same time, you also experience some real and discouraging defeats. Ray Ortland acknowledges this fight that we're in. Like I say, I love how he is honest about it. We're in this fight. And he sees that much of the fight, then, is a battle against discouragement. As we seek to live and yet seek to face up to the fact that we often fail to be even what we want to be, let alone what we know the Lord wants us to be. And here's this sentence that encouraged me uh, from Ray Orland. He gives us this counsel if we, we're fighting this discouragement. He says this, you'll win your fight by believing that God's love for you is too great to be limited to what you deserve. That's how you win the fight. Believing that God's love for you is too great to be limited by what you deserve. Because it's so easy, isn't it, to, in the Christian life, think, well, you know, God ought to love me this much because I've done this well today. It, what I deserve ought to come my way, and no more. Ray then says, that's wrong. Don't think like that. He says this, if you always see yourself living under a grim law of crime and punishment, you always getting the karma you deserve, then your hope will die. What he means by karma is that idea from other religions where you do something and you get something back. That's not Christianity. That's not grace. If you live like that, then whenever you fail, God's going to get you back. And I think he, what he's saying is that if you live like that, your discouragement will actually spiral into just despair. How am I ever going to live? This is what he says. I'm asking you to defy all the despair because God gives his best to people who deserve his worst. That's the grace of God. God gives his best to people who deserve his worst. You can't change how God functions. You can't change who God is and how he treats sinners. That's how he treats sinners. With what they don't deserve, not with what they do deserve. That's the only God there is. God of grace. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And because of that, there is always hope. So I want you to know this morning, there is always hope. If you are looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, if you're not looking to Christ, there's no hope for you. Right? Let's be clear about that. The only hope is in Jesus. You're trying to find it somewhere else or in yourself. There's no hope there. But in Him, there is always hope. And this reality, I think, is somewhat dramatically revealed in these last two chapters of the book of Kings. Because here we have God's people in basically the worst state they ever got into. They could go no lower than where they are now. They are in a state of utter disaster. They've been invaded and exiled. All their stuff has been broken up and taken away. All the people are gone. Leaders have been executed. The temple is destroyed. And yet still, somehow, the book manages to end with this glimmer of hope. With this story of Jehoiakim. Treated as he doesn't deserve, and in some way restored, even by the, the king under whose exile he's living. 
And because of that, somehow then, at the end of Kings, the line of the Messiah is still intact. The promises to Abraham and to David are still there because the line has not died out. The rescue, the rescuer, is still on the way, and therefore the rescue is still on. So I'm going to add an extra feature to Ray Ortland's assurance of God's unlimited love for you. Uh, uh, he, he says what's well, absolutely right. God gives his best to people who deserve his worst. But I'm going to do what the Bible always does, particularly, and tie that love to Christ Jesus. I'm going to say, if Jesus is still alive, there is still hope. Is Jesus still alive? Yes, he is. Then there is hope for you. You are not in a hopeless state. And if you come this morning and you know you're not a Christian or you're far from God, I'm saying there's still hope for you as well. If you will come to this Jesus who's still alive, who offers forgiveness for those who don't deserve it because of his cross, then there's hope for you as well. So don't give up hope. Don't despair. The kind of saviour Jesus is, is the kind who is unchangeably committed to your salvation, and if you're a Christian, to your progress in the grace of God. Ray Orland says, so maybe you are a mess, but with Jesus, you're a messy winner, because you're his mess. And so am I. You belong to Jesus in all your mess, if you're a Christian. And he is making sure you get to the end. So in Christ, I'm saying you can defy despair. You don't need to give in to despair in the Christian life. However badly you fail, whatever's going on, there's still hope in Christ. And so what I want to do is to get there by the end of this morning to this defiance of despair... But first, you have to travel through these chapters of destruction and disaster. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start out with destruction described, then disaster deserved. So bleak stuff to start with, but then the hope comes at the end. So let's look at destruction described. There's a lot going on in these chapters. Let's just give an overview here. It begins in the reign of Jehoiakim. We read about in chapter 23, verse 36. <clears throat> he was one of Josiah's Sons. Remember godly Josiah? Uh, he'd restored the temple, he'd found the book of the law, he'd made a covenant with the people, with God again. Um, so he was a good king, but his son, Jehoiakim, departed from his dad's example in a serious way. We're told in verse 37, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. If you're familiar with some other parts of the scripture, he's that king, remember, who burned Jeremiah's scroll, piece by piece. Remember that? Jeremiah bought the scroll, ripped out page by page, put it in the fire. That's who Jehoiakim is. He refuses to listen to God. And so, verse 1 of chapter 24, during Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land. And Jehoiakim becomes his vassal for three years, but then he rebels, and everything just goes to pot. The floodgates open. Verse 2 of chapter 24, the Lord sent Babylonian Aramean, Moabite, Ammonite raiders against him to destroy Judah. The nations, of, the Canaanite nations, once driven out, are flooding back in. The land is being returned to a situation pre-conquest, before Israel came in, when they were all in the land. They're coming back into the land. It's, it's, it's reversing uh, what happened all those years ago, and uh, Judah being thrown out of the land. That's just a start, though. I ought to say, actually, Again, if you're familiar with other parts of scripture, around this time, uh, this is when Daniel and his three friends uh, enter the story. We're not told that here, but they had taken off to Babylon about, about this time during, during Jehoiakim's reign. So there were godly people around, okay, but they are caught up in the chaos at the same time. The writer doesn't mention them, he moves swiftly on, verses 5 and 6, summarizing Jehoiakim's reign and telling us. How he died, and Jehoiakim, his son, takes over. Babylon is, 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 is taking over the, the whole scene. And that's why in verse 7 we read about the king of Egypt not marching out from his country again because the king of Babylon had taken all his territory from the wadi of Egypt to the river Euphrates. You think, well, that's what's that a kind of geographical detail? Well, it's very important from a Bible point of view because the wadi of Egypt to the river Euphrates was the borders of the land promised to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 15. This is the land we're going to give you. It's a huge territory, much bigger than Israel was for most of its existence, but it got that big during the reign of Solomon at the start of the book of Kings. That was the glory days. Now the writer is saying, 
This is all Nebuchadnezzar's now. All the land has been handed over. All that was promised to Abraham is now in the possession of the Gentile godless ruler because of the people's wickedness. And things get worse. So Jehoiakim, in his reign, um, he does evil as well. We're told in verse 9, evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father had done. And so there's a second invasion. And this 18-year-old king, Jehoiakim, he meekly surrenders to Nebuchadnezzar with mummy still holding his hands. He's, in verse uh, 12, we're told Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, all his officials surrendered to him. So there's this sense of weakness and um, submission to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He can't stand against him. Judah loses its king, loses its temple treasures, we read in verse 13, loses a whole bunch of people in verse 14. And there's a new puppet king installed in verse 17 who's called Zedekiah. And uh, he fares no better because when he rebels against Nebuchadnezzar, there's another further invasion, even bigger scale, which we read about at the beginning of chapter 25. And when he, Zedekiah, and his army flee, we read uh, about that in, in chapter 25, verses uh, kind of 4, 5, and 6. He flees, he's captured, he's basically, something very grisly happens to him, he's blinded. Um, just after they kill his sons before his eyes, in verse 7. But all of that, I, in this, there are two little things I just want to draw out here. Two locations that the writer wants us to notice. First is Jericho. Verse 5 of chapter 25 says that the Babylonian overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. Why Jericho? Because that's the place where they entered the land. So again, uh, we're being returned to a time prior to the conquest where they came in, where they conquered the land, Jericho. Now they're finally being relieved of the land. There's this kind of complete reversal, a return to where they started. There's been no progress at all in that sense. And also... We're told they fled, verse 4, near the king's garden. Now, I might not be quite uh, on, on the nose about this, but I think it's quite a rare word, that word, the garden. It's not used very much in scripture, but it is used consistently for the Garden of Eden. And I think maybe what the author is doing is he's, he's kind of repainting these events in the light of what happened all the way back at the start of history, where God's people were in God's place, but then they got thrown out of the garden. And now, here, God's people in God's place getting thrown out again through the garden. There's that sense of the whole thing is just being wrecked, just as Adam and Eve wrecked things for the rest of humanity. Now, the, the nation, Israel, who were meant to restore the nations to know God, they too have failed, and they've been thrown out of the land as well. So, the point is that however well we do for a while, like Adam did, like Israel did, we human beings just cannot avoid failing and avoiding the curse. Adam failed, Israel failed, what we need is a non-failure. We need a new Adam, we need a new Israel. And we'll get to him soon. Just to go over the last few bits of this uh, passage, after Zedekiah and his officials are executed, uh, we read about that in verses 6 and 7, and then the officials executed over the page in verses 18 down to verse 21, once that happens, Jerusalem, once the apple of God's eye is burned to the ground, chapter 25, verses 9 and 10, people are exiled to Babylon, the last. A lot of them, apart from the very few uh, poorest people, in verse 12, are left behind uh, to work the vineyards and the fields. Even the temple is exiled bit by bit. It's kind of taken apart. The, the bronze pillars, all the fire pans, everything that was used, we're told in verses 13, 14, 14, 15, 16, 17, all taken off to um, Babylon. So the whole kind of system is taken over to exile. Nothing is left. Part, as I said, from these last few people in the land, but even they end up going because there's a new governor appointed to look after them, a man called Gedaliah. We read about in verse 22. He was a, a good man. Other parts of the Bible give us the idea he was a, a godly man, and yet he ends up assassinated by this little group, crowd of people led by Ishmael in verse 25. And now even the last dregs of the people flee. Verse 26, 
This, all the people, from the least to the greatest, together with the army officers, fled to Egypt for fear of the Babylonians. So now, literally, there's no one at all left in the land. It's just a wasteland. It's left for the jackals and the desert owls. It's just a place that's prophesied by God's and prophets, if you rebel against me, I throw you out completely. He flushes the land clear completely of all people. And where do they end up? These last ones end up where? Egypt. Would well, you see what's happening again? Where did they come from? Right at the start. They were rescued from Egypt. But now they're back in the land of slavery. They're in Egypt. There's, this, there's been this whole kind of reversal. Complete destruction. Complete misery. Destruction. Described. That's the overview of what happens in those couple of chapters. Now I grant, my, that's just a lot of description, a lot of description, rather, just a lot of um, detail. All I've done really so far is describe. So let's come back now and just apply it for a moment under the heading Disaster Deserved. Disaster Deserved. The, the author of Kings ties all of this that's happened to a particular particular reason does that in a couple of places at least he wants us to see why is all this going on so chapter 24 and verse 3 let's go back there 24 verse 3 surely these things happened to judah according to the lord's command in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of manasseh and all he had done he was the king a couple of kings ago including the shedding of innocent blood for he had filled jerusalem with innocent blood and the lord was not willing to forgive so the God who's a forgiving God gets to a point where it's too late and he won't forgive any longer. And he drives them out because of the great wickedness that's in the land. Similarly, in chapter 24, verse 20, we're told it was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah and in the end he thrust them from his presence. Okay, so the author is saying it's a disaster and the disaster is deserved. It's not random. It's not just the happenstance of history that the Babylonians invaded. It was God doing it, because disaster is the end point of all sin. All rebellion against God, it leads to disaster in the end. And we need that highlighted in a dark passage like this, because it can be easy to forget that the wages of sin is death. It can be easy to forget it, because normally when we sin, nothing happens. Not straight away. At least sometimes there's immediate consequences. We do something wrong and come back comes back to bite us. We lie and we're found out and there's shame. We do something that's hurtful to someone else and it causes a breach in the relationship. That can happen, but often we can sin in ways against God. No one really knows about, it, no one sees, it's just in our hearts. Or we sin in our hearts against others. No one sees, there seem to be no consequences. In God's long-suffering mercy, we can sin, or someone else can sin, and nothing seems to happen. It just seems to carry on with life. No reprisals, no apparent consequences. And certainly, whether there's kind of consequences in just the fabric of life, there's no hell to pay straight away, is there? Because I've sinned this week and I didn't go to hell. And you've sinned this week and you didn't go to hell. You didn't die. As God said, the, sin, the soul that sins shall die. That's because, of course, great mercy. But part of the scripture like this, I need to just remind us, actually, that when we do sin, disaster will come on us in the end. Right? The wages of sin is death. Judgment never disappears. It just waits for God's time. But here's what I want to be really clear about this. If you're a Christian and you're failing in some way, if you, you feel the weight of your sin, your failure to love God with all your heart and soul, if you're struggling with that, then it's so important to realise this. I am not saying, I am not saying that God's judgment is hanging over you. I am not saying that. I am not saying that God's judgment is just waiting for you and you better be afraid. Quite the opposite. For you, if you're a Christian, God's judgment has awaited its time and that time has come and gone already before you were even born. Judgment has already fallen on you, and you never noticed because it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt you anyway. But there was this day 2,000 years ago when you were hidden, and all your sickness and your shame and your sin, your evil against God, you were hidden in the person of Jesus Christ at a place called Golgotha. You were there. You were there in him. I was there in him. And God included all your rottenness in him. And made him sin with your sin. 
And by cursing and judging him in the fires of hell, he judged you. So the judgment is over. All your eternity in hell was compressed into three unimaginable hours of darkness for him. It's impossible to understand how the infinite Son of God could have been submerged in that eternity for just that time, but in submerged he was. And so your judgment died with Christ on the cross, and it shall never again be dredged up. That's the gospel. Sin deserves death, and Christ died for sinners. And that means that if you're in Christ, if you're holding on even by a thread to him, judgment cannot haunt you now. Judgment has no say over your life. It has been finished with. Yes, you deserve disaster, but Christ has stood in your place and taken it for you. Let me return to this man, Ray Orland, this pastor in St. Hell Cry. This is what he thinks. This is what he says. And I think for me, maybe for you too, it sums up things very, very well. He says this. Maybe you look at your mess and you think, if God has any self-respect, he must despise me. He'd be wrong not to despise me. Because look at me. Look at my mess. But Ray Orton says, self-punishment like that doesn't make you more forgivable. It blocks your way to forgiveness. Why? Because God is inviting you to come out of hiding and stand tall again. God, says Raymond, God is not at war with you. Why? Because you aren't really all that bad? No. You are really all that bad. But, he says, in one blinding moment of painful atonement on the cross, the dark energy of your evil forever lost its bid for supremacy. I love that. I need that. In that blinding moment of atonement on the cross, the dark energy of my evil forever lost its bid for supremacy in my life. It no longer has to say over me and no longer has to say over you because it had its say over Christ. And he paid and it's done. And he's been raised from the dead and is alive to save us and rescue us. Judgment is disaster deserved. But in Jesus, it is disaster averted. So, friends, brothers, sisters, do you need to come back to the cross again? Do I need to come back to the cross again and realise God is not at war with you? He is on your side in your war against sin. And part of that is realising judgement is done, it's over, it's paid for. And now you are free to live in obedience and thankfulness to what he's done for you. In other words, it's for this reason, for Christ's sake, that you can have hope. And that's what we're getting to now at the end of these chapters. We've seen destruction described, we've seen disaster um, deserved, but now we can defy despair. I want you to defy despair. There's hope at the end of the book of Kings, remarkably. I read this story about hope this week. I read a story about a woman called Anne Moody. Anne Moody was a black student uh, who was active in America's civil rights movement uh, in the 1960s. And at that time, one strategy of the civil rights movement in America was for half a dozen or so students, black students, to turn up at a white church, church with all white people, to turn up at the white church for a morning service. And half a dozen students would, would go and, and visit these churches to make a point about how unwelcome they were to worship God with white people. Now it seems incredible to us, I guess, maybe maybe not so much to some of you, but certainly it seems incredible to me and probably most of you, but black men and women simply were not allowed to worship God alongside white people in those churches. And sometimes the police were waiting in the foyer to make sure that the black men and women got turned away. That was the extent of the problem during the 1960s in America. But on this occasion, Anne Moody, this black student, was part of this small group of <coughs> other students who turned up to another white church, than what particular white church it was, and instead of being refused entry, the people in the foyer welcomed them and said, hello, it's nice to see you, come in, 
here are some seats for you. Please come and join us. And I remember he says, I was there for a good five minutes before I was able to compose myself. I couldn't believe it. I had never prayed with white people in a white church before, but we had got all got in. She was stunned. She never thought this could happen. But she was even more moved when the service came to a close. Because to her, ast her astonishment, as soon as the service came to a close, the pastor who'd been preaching, he came up straight away to them and he said, it's been great to see you here. Will you come again next week? That broke the spell of despair for Anne Moody. Right? So there's just no way forward, she thought. It's just never going to happen. But that broke the spell of despair. This is what she says. He said it as if he meant it. And I began to have a little hope. Now I think that is what we get from the last paragraph of the book of Two Kings. Right? You're supposed to begin to get a little hope. I'm not saying it's like, wow, amazing sort of gospel promises like Isaiah 40 or something. We're not saying that. We're not saying it's just this glaring brightness of hope. But there is the beginning of a little hope. And that's so relevant, I think, to you. If you think your life is simply all just bleakness and despair, you think, where am I ever going to make progress? Am I really going to get over this pattern of sin I struggle with? Well, you have to think again. Because there is hope. There is always hope. We might have forgotten about Jehoiakim, right? All that history we looked at in the first part of this. Wicked king of Judah. He gets carried off in the middle of it somewhere. Back in chapter 24, verse 15, he's taken off to Babylon. And you think, well, maybe he ended up executed like Zedekiah. Maybe he ended up just forgotten to history completely. But no, he's that boy king, 18 years old. Off he goes into exile. Now he's 55. 37th year of his exile. We're told in verse 27. A new king comes to Babylon. Our Marduk. And what does he do? We're told he released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And Jehoiakim gets new clothes. And he gets a seat of honour. And he gets food at the king's table. And he gets the provision for all he needs. We're told in verses 28 and 29. And the, the very last verse of the, of the book, day by day, the king gave Jehoiakim a regular allowance, as long as he lived. So this, this little glimmer of life at the end of this passage about death and destruction. As long as he lived, he's provided for. So why does this happen? It's, it's a mystery, isn't it? It's just stated at the end. Is it because Jehoiakim has somehow earned his way back into favour? He spent 37 years of his life showing, I can be a good prisoner. No, it's not. Is it because he deserves good treatment? No. It's simply, I think, because God wanted to show us that his love, as Ray Orton said earlier, his love is too great to be limited to what we deserve. Absolutely, Jehoiakim deserved to die in prison. He deserved to run away. He deserved hell and judgment. Who knows where he ended up for eternity? What we're being told here in this kind of picture of God's mercy is that he was restored and brought back to life, which he didn't deserve. Because as long as God is God, there is always hope for sinners. So defy despair. Don't lose hope. Because there's even more than this. Because if you look on beyond the end of two kings, you see what happens. God wanted us to see that his promises are still intact. And that's why Jehoiakim particularly is mentioned. Because God had promised David that a king would arise from David's line who would destroy the curse and save the world. Where is that king going to come from if David's line is wiped out completely? Well, he can't come, can he? So the line needs to stay intact. So right at the climax then of the most terrible judgment Israel ever experienced, God is saying, the line's still here. The rescuer is still coming for wretched people like Jehoiakim and like me and like you. Because if you fast forward into Matthew's Gospel and the very first chapter of Matthew's Gospel, you will read there that Jehoiakim had a son. And the son was called Sheltiel. And then Sheltiel had a son. And the son was called Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel had a son. And he was called Abihud. And Abihud had a son who was called Eliakim. And Eliakim had a son called Azor. And he had a son called Zadok. And Zadok had a son called Achim. And Achim's great-grandson was called Matan. And Matan's boy was called Jacob. And Jacob fathered Joseph. 
the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. That's what Matthew says. We got there. We got to Jesus. And that Messiah, though he was dead, behold, he is alive forevermore. And as long as he is alive, there is hope. And he will never stop being alive. So there is hope. There is hope for me. Wretched me. Hope for you. All your need and sin. Don't stay away from Jesus. Come to him and find hope in your darkest, direst needs. He will have you. Whoever comes to me, I'll never drive away. He will have you. He will have me. I exhort you then, even if you feel you're at your very lowest point, to resist the accusations of Satan, to plant your feet again in the solid ground of the cross and the resurrection, to turn your face towards Jesus and defy your own despair. Let's pray together. Help us to do this, Father. We can't do it without your Holy Spirit's help. We need your grace to defy the despair that sometimes rises up within us and tells us we're not good enough. You're not going to spend any more time with us. Lord, help us to remember that you give your best to those who deserve your worst. Help us to hold on to the gospel. Help us to defy our own despair and to turn to Christ who will never turn away anyone who comes to him. Help us, we pray, for his sake and glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.